In his 39-year military career, General Ostenberg has overseen troops for many different operations. He has come here now to talk about their time in the Middle East. You don't want to miss this one. Stay tuned. Welcome to The Better Part, a program that encompasses a diverse spectrum of topics important to our community, which we hope will both inform and entertain you. We invite you to sit back and enjoy the program. I'm happy to introduce Major General Robert B. Ostenberg, U.S. Army Retired. So happy you're here with us, General. Thank you for coming. Wonderful to be here with you today. Now, when you were here previously, you told us about your Vietnam experience as a 24-year-old platoon leader, fresh out of officer school. And with this time, we're going to be talking about the Middle East. And what was your assignment prior to 9-11? Just prior to 9-11, I was the uh, Deputy Commanding General for a 63rd Regional Support Command down in Los Alamitos, California. And on the 11th of September, I was preparing to get my orders for promotion, which were supposed to be approved that day, and then I would have the change of command following that. Uh, that was interrupted, to say the least. So uh, uh, it, was, it was a complicated day, and uh, a day that was not not going to be forgotten by anybody in this country, but it was for the military it was extremely important because of the, the shutdown of all the infrastructure across the country and, and they turned to the military for essential things like protection and also having flights for the right people to get in the right places at the right time. So were, you just were rushed off somewhere then to your assignment? Or? I was rushed to my, my living room where <laughs> I had four, uh, three cell phones and a line land going. Oh. So uh, it, was, it was busy. Uh, there was no time to get anywhere because I was here in California. That's how it works, huh? It does. You were the, uh, the high-ranking officer in California? I was, the, I was the ranking because I was the most senior. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the Army Reserve, um, we had all a lot of the resources that were needed for uh, responses to whether it be mm -hmm. a disaster, a, an attack, uh, or just uh, an earthquake or floods or fires or those types of things. A very diverse organization of, at the time, 9,500. We grew to about 14,000 uh, as we went into Afghanistan and, and Iraq and, and added units uh, that we really needed, that were desperately needed. Tell us about uh, the reserves today. Uh, what kinds of people are joining the reserves? Well, the, as, you, as you know, we're, we're at war, and one would think that it would be very difficult to maintain and raise an all-volunteer force. But th those joining the reserve or the active army or the guard are pretty much all the same. They have a passion for uh, uh, patriotism. Uh, they see an organization that is highly regarded. Uh, and in many cases, uh, when you're talking about the Guard and the Reserve, they don't want to necessarily leave a, a job that they have, but they do want to serve, and they know that they may get called up, and they're willing to do that, uh, but they do want to maintain that civilian occupation. And that, in particular, is a, a tremendous advantage for the Army Reserve forces, because I can give you an example. Uh, one day I was uh, in uh, Bagram, Afghanistan. And the commander of the organization, the ground forces in Afghanistan, had in, in that area, in, on the base there, an, a gorgeous, absolutely wonderful command uh, tent that he got from Germany. And it, it looked like NASA inside with all tiered uh, benching and, and off to the side they had separate rooms for his personnel, his operations, his logistics people. And they couldn't figure out how to get them to communicate, and his, uh, his IT people couldn't figure it out either. Well, I was there and I had been talking earlier in the day to one of my uh, intelligence uh, soldiers. He's an enlisted soldier and works for a small company. Uh, I can't mention the name here, probably wouldn't be appropriate, but it's, it, I say small. It's a huge company and one of the largest ones in the country. And, 
And so um, I, I, we were talking about the situation there, and he said, I can fix that. And he had it fixed within 24 hours. People are still enlisting in the military, aren't they, as regular soldiers? Or? They, they are. I mean, uh -huh. they, they can go to a recruiting station, and they can be placed in either a guard, an army res I'm talking army reserve. now, army guard, mm -hmm. army reserve. Mm -hmm. um, and the difference is the National Guard is what we call Title 13, and they are, res they, they are responsible to the governor of the state. But they can also be put on Title 10, which is a federal status, and that's what Army Reserve people are Title 10, and um, so they they are on the federal side, just mm -hmm. like the active components mm -hmm. are. But again, mm -hmm. obviously in reserve status. The reserves get the same training as the people who enlist for regular duty. Then everybody that goes in that is going in as an enlisted soldier, regardless of component, active, reserve. Uh, is going to get the same basic training that everyone gets, as I say. Uh, they then go and they have a specialty, and they would move on to that, and that again is also its advanced training in whatever the specialty they've been chosen. And that, uh, that too is standardized between the components. In the reserves you find, for instance, an awful lot of medical people, and if, the, if they're a doctor or a physician, they're going to go in as an officer, but they still go through the same officer basic course, for training to get indoctrinated into how to salute, how to march, and, and the military side of it. Uh, but they already have their training skills for their position, and their lawyers would be the same thing. But in the reserves, we have so many things that are not found in quantity in the active components. For instance, the medical is one of those. So if you're going to have a need for medical in any contingency, you're going to be calling up the reserve components. Um, most units have small, like EMT type people, but very few of them have in, in, in their organization physicians, pedi you know, pediatricians or, or surgeons or heart surgeons or cardiologists, those type of things. So it's something that, it, that they turn the reserves for, and that's, uh, that's pretty key in this war that we're in now. Well, and you heard early on about all the things that were taken from the right. museums. Mm -hmm. and, and there's another uh, example of we had some people in the reserve components that had worked as curators in museums as civilians, and they took a couple of those and put them in charge of tracking all the stuff down. The Army Reserve and the military today, um, and it was this way in 2001, basically, I can say is totally different than it was in the 70s and the 80s, as far, as, far as preparedness goes. The training has always been great when you go in and, and you maintain your skills, but there was never really, uh, other than field training exercises and those types of things that you go to the field and have mock battles, they were big and you'd never know if you did well or you didn't do well, or if everybody down to the lower levels was trained, were trained. And so uh, I attribute this to uh, Chief of Staff of the Army in the mid-90s, Dennis Reimer, who was interested in making sure that at all levels, individuals, units, organizations knew exactly what they were supposed to do and how to do it, and they worked in concert with each other. So we was born uh, out, of, out of that idea, situational training exercises, which would base uh, the exercise on a specific mission, and it was for larger level units more than for smaller. And then you had your um, your lower, lower level, company level and below, lane training, which I dealt with an awful lot as a brigadier general and as a colonel even before that in getting soldiers ready to go. Now we were still looked as a, as a reserve that was going to be there at last resort. But uh, the training that came on board was exceptional and General Reimer came out actually to see one of my organizations doing infantry training uh, down at, uh, in Fort Hunter Liggett in, in uh, Central California, I guess it'd be considered. Um, and he saw how well the reserves were doing that he, it just, he said, this is something we need to do with everybody and, and it will make us a one force type of our army organization. But the, this, is, this is how it kind of works. You'd take an, a, a small a company or a platoon or whatever and you'd give them uh, the requirements of what they needed to do for this particular 
exercise, this lane that they were going to go through. And it'd be like walking through a lane going from point A to point B. And the nice thing about it is if they weren't really up to speed, you could crawl go through it very slowly and go piece by piece and kind of train it as you go along. Uh, then they would go through at a walk pace and then they'd go through as a run as they got more proficient. But th the interesting thing about it is they'd go and, and if they did something just horribly wrong in the very first part of it, you'd just stop it right there and you'd go through an analysis of what they did right and what they did wrong. And then we'd restart it again in another location so they couldn't memorize where everything was going to happen. Uh, but the, ab the, the idea was that you'd flow through that in a realistic situation with mortar fire, with machine gun fire coming in, and, and how do you react to it? You get to a minefield, how do you react to that? Uh, convoys, driving a convoy from point A to point B and, and having a live, not live, they'd have a live fire exercise from the con convoy at attackers that are all being done mechanically being fired at with blanks, firing at our trucks, but live fire going back and, and being able to return that and react and how to dismount and do all those types of things they need to do. And then after it all again it is an after action review. They would say, what did you think you did right? What do you think you did wrong? How can you make it better? Okay, let's go out and do that one portion again. And it, it was just a way to get hands-on proficiency and they do it over and over and over again. And I think that really made the, I'm saying even back in Vietnam, it made the troops that were ready to go to war in 2001 extremely proficient. And at that time, we didn't, you know, it wasn't like when I came back from Vietnam, most of the units that I served in early on in the divisions, probably two-thirds of them were active, former active component people that came back from Vietnam and had experience. Uh, we gained that again after the first part of the war all the experienced people that were back in the, coming back and staying in the reserves. The attrition was down. The recruiting was up. In most of the years, except one that I can think of, when they had the surge and they were required to hire 10,000 more active component soldiers over what the criteria was at the beginning of the year, and this is about midterm, I think they fell short for, of getting the extra 10,000 by around 1,400. But every year other than that, the recruiting has had to shut down before uh, September 31st, which is the end of the year, because they just had too many people that were joining the military. Well, let's talk about Iraq, Pakistan, Afghanistan. What would you like to tell us about the reserves in the Middle East over there? The reserves in Afghanistan, where I was in 2002 and 2003, and for that matter, the coalition organizations that are there, and some of those are reserve also. But uh, my, my units were spread, uh, spread around the country and were doing just a tremendous job. And they weren't fillers. They were actually working in jobs that they had to have them in because there weren't the active component people to fill those positions. I had a large medical units uh, both in Afghanistan and a, and a whole brigade in uh, the, the green zone in Iraq. Um, during this, uh, this, uh, the wars. But uh, the other thing that are very plentiful over there and, and only found in, uh, in, in quantities in the reserves are civil affairs. Now, civil affairs soldiers actually go out and they uh, build infrastructure and try and put the country back together uh, again using the resources that, that, are at, uh, that, that they have and also with the resources that the Army will give them because they sometimes need drilling water drilling wells, uh, equipment, and they sometimes need things like uh, bulldozers that, uh, that they can get commercially or, or get over in there to do road work or whatever. And they get engineers involved to do that. And so it's pretty complex trying to fit all those pieces together. And Afghanistan at the time was one of the largest uh, uh, problem areas for landmines. Uh, the Russians really kind of just threw them out there and no one knew really where they were. So some of the coalition forces, the Australians and some of our forces, engineers, were taking care of clearing those minefields. Um, mm -hmm. But the um, medical is one of the very large ones, as I said, that uh, the, the hospitals were, were busy taking care of locals. Uh, many children that would get in the wrong place and, and hit a mine. Uh, we also worked with those that were getting si sick because of the water they were drinking, which was mostly undrinkable. Uh, if we gauged by our level of sanitation, 
So we, in a period of a short period of time, put in about 600 water wells just in the the, the Bagram and uh, Afghanistan and also the Kandahar area. And I think that was a great help. Uh, building schools was another thing that we did. And uh, um, I can remember once going over to a school where we were putting in a water well and, and they had been there for about 28 days and, and had, uh, had gone down about 10 meters and they need to go 30 meters to hit water. Uh, and I was with a civil affairs officer and I had my interpreter ask, uh, get involved and find out you know, what the situation was and did they know they only had a couple days left. And I think they felt as long as they're working, they're going to get a paycheck. I asked my interpreter to tell them that if they didn't finish in two days, then the contract would be withdrawn. They would not get any more work with the, with the government. And we are hiring locals for this, these jobs. And so I left there and went to a, a teaching institute, which was teaching women and, and men to be teachers. Um, now there were 74 women there, I never saw any of those, but, the, but I did see the institute and, and we had a great discussion. I, when I went back by that, uh, that school that was having the water well drilled there, they had something that looked like a Texas oil rig out there <laughs> and they were finished the next day. You had uh, some things you especially wanted to talk about. Um, one was um, Jessica Lynch, I think, and... Um, I had, uh, we, I talked medical, I had a, a medic, medical units over there that were acting more, they were our, our ambulance drivers and they would go to wherever the need was. And, and um, uh, Jessica Lynch, as you'll recall, was captured along with uh, other people in her company and held prisoners. And uh, one of my uh, medical vehicles uh, with, with a medic and a driver in it, uh, both medically qualified, uh, were uh, added to the group that went to rescue Jess Jessica Lynch and her compadres. And um, uh, this was his, I think, 101st or 102nd mission that he had been on. And the, the, the mission was successful, as we all know, and all the people were, were, were released or taken uh, and, and uh, were moved back to the U.S. and, and taken care of physically and, and mentally. But uh, what uh, happened with Paul Nakamura, who was the medic involved on the, about two or three missions later is he was killed by um, uh, a, a uh, RPG going through his medical vehicle that has a huge round white circle on it with a big red cross on it. He had picked up, uh, and his driver had picked up a wounded soldier and, and Paul Nakamura shielded that soldier but lost his life doing that. And that was the first soldier that I lost in, the, in uh, that was in Iraq. And um, I've, I've lost, lost a couple others, uh, and one woman and, and, and three other men, and, and it was uh, uh, strange, but I had met every one of them, and when you have a force of 14,000, it's unlikely, but um, it, it happens, and they were just absolutely the best representatives of, of, a, of a citizen, concerned individuals, top-notch people, and very, very sad but that they, they join a long list of the same type of people who have sacrificed for these wars. The woman was uh, driving a big, heavy uh, truck, was she not? Uh, she was. Uh, Tina T. May um, was probably 105 pounds soaking wet and about 5'2", five, 5'3", five, and her brother and her sister were serving over there. She's from American Samoa. And... Um, uh, her brother was Army, and, and they actually reunited and got together and got some pictures over there. But Tina was driving a very, uh, one of our biggest trucks of recovery vehicles. So kind of uh, not, not the picture of what you'd expect, but uh, she was uh, great at doing that job, and, and uh, she was killed on a, on a convoy. And then Bolor? Uh, Kelly Bolar was, uh, um, well... He was a little bit older than the, than the first two that I just mentioned, but in his 30s. And he uh, um, was a, a great soldier who was uh, killed in November, just before Saddam Hussein was found, but uh, was in the organization, the 4th Infantry, was looking for Saddam heavily at that time. And they, had, they were looking at a bunch of different places. But as he took off in an, a helicopter with two helicopters actually taking off together, they collided 
and uh, everybody was lost in that, that, uh, that accident. When you first arrived over there, what did you think and what did you see? Well, I was <coughs> sent over for, uh, for a number of reasons, but one was to not only just see uh, where, where my people were and what their, their struggles and, and needs were, and I'll start with Afghanistan, um, but I was there to also see what the, oper the operations side of it and what was going on there. And um, it, was, uh, it was interesting because uh, of the number of coalition organizations that were in the same locations where, where the Army Reserve people were located. Um, and in working with the active component, trying to make sure that there was equality between everybody, um, it wasn't a hard task because I think we all understand that. But, you know, when a, a unit goes home, another unit comes in, you, you may have still people there from the Army Reserve that kind of overlap, and you may have Australians there or uh, people from uh, other, other nations that are there. I guess I could, the, the Czechs were there. I mean, we had quite a, quite a conglomerate there, mm -hmm. all doing incredibly great work. And, uh, and so it's, it was uh, one of the early things that was, that was difficult was, okay, now how do you, how do you, the people that are still there, how do you kind of educate and break in the people that are coming in? And, but they, they figured it out, and there were pretty seamless, uh, seamless uh, transitions. That was Afghanistan. That was Afghanistan. And then? In, uh, well, I can tell you this. When I was there in 2002, and then I returned back in 2003, I felt safer in 2002 than I did in 2003. We were getting a few more IEDs going off there. The Afghan National Army, while being, getting trained up, um, had some good units and some that weren't as good at the time, but uh, they've, they've certainly improved since then. Um, we had, uh, I think we had the right mix of people there, but there were a lot of people that were diverted to, to Iraq that, that I, I feel personally, and I guess I can say this now, should have, should have remained in Iraq and we should have plussed up, uh, or Af they should have remained in Afghanistan, I'm sorry, and should have, uh, uh, plus up maybe Iraq in a different fashion because we, we lost a little bit of ground there. And in uh, Iraq, um, uh, the units that I had there were spread all over the place. So I, I, I got to see a couple units, uh, or I went to travel to see the units that I had there rather than sitting on a, on a base and talking to them on the phone or, or whatever. And, and so uh, um, I, I went out on convoys with several of my units. I had a transportation units that, uh, that I had over there, and, and they were trained to do a mission with a particular kind of a truck that is to resupply those in the battlefield. And they were very, very good at it. Uh, so this truck was going over there all prepared to do their mission of hauling supplies around. And when they got there, they turned in those fancy vehicles that allowed them to turn around in a very quick period of time and they drew these big five-ton trucks. They put armor siding on the side of it and sandbags inside of it and they became gun truck people. Not only driving them but also to man, man the machine guns and they would go on convoy escorts. But you saw that with the Air Force had to do some of that. Uh, and the, for instance the Navy took over from my soldiers that were doing intelligence work in Guantanamo. So people were doing a lot of things they hadn't been really trained for, but that they were qualified for, and uh, it, was, it was a little surprise. But uh, with that truck unit I had, uh, they were attacked once, and, and the, the lieutenant that was commanding a company, which is, should be a captain, but she was a lieutenant, uh, had, a, had a kill zone that was behind her, and, and one of her vehicles was down. She turned around, told, uh, told him to keep traveling on. She went back and jumped out of the vehicle, hooked up a chain tow bar, and, and uh, pulled, the, pulled the vehicle out of the kill zone. And I understand that you spent a little time in one of Saddam's homes, palaces. Yes, this is a, um, one of Saddam's plates. It, that's his kind of Dinner crest plate. on the top, and, and on the back they have the royal, you know, the royal seal. And, and I did not steal it. I, I had somebody, I mean, I, I bought it for this. You. I had somebody steal it. <laughs> no, I bought, I did pay for this. And I, I have a couple goblets here that were in the, in the presidential palaces. And who knows how they got into where they got. But uh, 
they were available out there, as well as uh, uh, lots of lots of dinars that were with Saddam's picture on handsome it, which we picture on yeah, it. handsome uh, yeah young nice picture of him on there mm -hmm. and so uh, I, I did get a couple of these that had somebody procure them for me uh, I understand that you slept in one of his beds I was uh, yes I I, uh, I showed you a picture of the, the the, his palace, and this was one where mm -hmm. there were a lot of the uh, wild animals that were so talked about back then because they were not cared for, and we took mm -hmm. veterinarians in there and, and tried to save as many as we could. But the palace was uh, also where General Casey at the time, uh, which uh, was is a great leader, uh, became, later became a chief of staff um, of the army, but uh, General Casey for two, I don't know, three, over three years, almost three and a half years, had the mission of kind of pulling uh, our reputation out amongst the uh, Iraqis and, and uh, instead of debathifying and firing everybody and hard-handed things, we, he started the reversal to get out with our leaders and talking to the imams and the village chiefs and, and seeing what we could do to help them and even in the Sunni Triangle, which was a real dicey area for a long time, and, and Fallujah. Uh, Fallujah, I had a military police company there that was there for six months. They extended them six months, and then another three months while the Marines were trying to take back Fallujah. And so we, those are the memories that, that were early on, but he really turned it around. In the Sunni Triangle, they realized that we weren't the ones that blew up the Golden Mosque. We weren't the ones that were bombing and setting off explosives in their marketplaces, et cetera, et cetera. And, and they actually went on the hunt with us to try and, and help clean up and, and pacify the area. And it became a very, very peaceful, more peaceful area, I'll put it that way, than, than it had been in the past. And I think that's, I attribute that to General Casey and his, his understanding of what, what do you do to help a country versus uh, uh, just going there to d defeat the enemy. Once again, we're happy you joined us. We look forward to having you with us next time. Bye for now.